Well, welcome everybody. So glad to have you guys here. Happy Easter to everybody. Um, by the way, if we haven't met, again, my name is Steve and I serve as the lead pastor here at Lifeway Church. <laughs> That's so kind. Thank you so much. God gets all the glory and the checks in the mail. Thanks for the, the applause. Um, we have been uh, taking a journey through the events that lead up to the most important event of human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we've been doing through the past several weeks. We called this series The Journey to the Empty Tomb. If you're first arriving here today, you're in luck because this is the finale. So here you are. Hope it's good. Anyways, um, now next week we're going to start a brand new message series called Pre-Decide. Uh, if becoming the person that you want to be, what if, what if becoming the person that you wanted to be begins long before you make the decisions, right? Before you click buy, <laughs> before you take one more bite of that thing that you probably shouldn't be eating, or you lash out at the people that you love, can the decisions that you make today help you really live the life that you want to live tomorrow? Well, let's learn together, beginning next Sunday, as we kick off pre-decide, better choices, better life. And I'm just going to have to tell you in advance to excuse me, got a little respiratory thing's been going for a while here, so... Now, if you know me, you know I'm really good at misplacing things. In fact, it's kind of like my superpower, okay? You know, some superheroes are known for their courage and their strength like Captain America, but me, I'm a bit more like Captain Misplace, okay? I can make things disappear in the blink of an eye, though usually not on purpose. Recently, I lost the TV remote, and I looked everywhere. I looked under the couch. I looked in the couch. I looked in the kitchen. I even looked in the bathroom. Yes, I, I found it there before. Um, finally, I gave up. And what I did is I installed a remote control app on my wife, Tina, on her phone. And I'm like, problem solved. All right? She's happy, happy wife, happy life. The next day, Tina went to take out some frozen chicken. And instead, she found a frozen fire TV remote. Okay, in our freezer. Now, I've thought about making a list of all the weird places that I found my stuff, but I'd probably lose that list as well. So, oh, thank you so much for the tea. Let's give an applause for my wife here. This is my wife, Tina. You could tell she's so shy when you heard her singing, right? She's just so shy. Look at this, I got all kinds of drinks up here. It was really funny, uh, this morning, I go, and before the service, I, I go in the back room and I pray, and we were out of cups, there was no cups, and so the only cup that I could find was this one over here that says, I know I'm messing up the camera crew, Bah Humbug. <laughs> and it's got like, a, it's got like a, a gingerbread man like cracked in half that's like sad, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is perfect for Easter morning. Anyways. So, Tina and I, we looked in all the expected places for this remote, but it turned out we were looking in all the wrong places. How many of you ever experienced that yourselves? Yeah. And likewise, I would argue that life can be like that as well. Sometimes we look for what we need, but we do it in the wrong places, right? Whether it's validation or, or self-worth or, or love or happiness, sometimes we look in the wrong places. Who could be honest enough to admit that today? My hand is up, okay, because this drives a lot of the wrong things that we do. Now, I think we all can identify with that, but here's the thing. God wants us to experience love and validation and, and all those things and more, but we need to look in the right place. Today, we're going to turn to Luke chapter uh, 24. Um. And we're going to look at some women who came to a tomb to find Jesus. And as it turns out, they were looking for the right thing, but in the wrong place. Let me set the stage. The women who followed Jesus, who had seen his miracles, who had listened to his teaching, were overcome with, with grief as they had witnessed Jesus' brutal crucifixion. And I hope there's no real little ones here, but I'm going to describe to you just a little bit about what that was like witnessing that. First was the, the scourging, which was by Roman flagrum. I have a picture of one here. It was, not, it was made with leather th uh, thongs with metal, metal balls, 
and sharp objects that were woven into it, pieces of bone. It wasn't designed so much to whip, but to rip and to tear flesh and to open up wounds down to muscle. And there'd be such a massive blood loss that often people would die just from this punishment here. The next was, of course, the crown of thorns that was cruelly placed on his head and the mocking of the soldiers, followed by the jeers of the crowd as he carried across a half mile uphill to Golgotha, the place they call the skull. And there they laid him on the ground on this cross and where they nailed his hands and his feet to that cross. And then they lift him up and think about this and pressure and then boom, drop him into the hole as he's on that cross. And then they watched for six hours as he suffered and then breathed his last. It was an experience that they would never forget. It was etched in their, in their minds forever. That was Friday. And now it's early Sunday morning and they are on a mission of mercy as they are carrying spices with them. They're intending to anoint Jesus' body as a final act of devotion for their beloved rabbi. As they approached the tomb, their minds were racing, even wondering, how can we gain access to the body? Because there was, there was a large stone that had been rolled in front of the tomb. But they pressed on, driven by their love and loyalty to Jesus. We're going to pick it up. Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 1. It says, And on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had uh, prepared and went to the tomb. Now, most scholars believe there are actually uh, four to five women that came here in total. If you look at all the different gospel accounts, in Luke verse uh, 10, Luke gives us the name of three of them. He says it's Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Joanna, who Luke tells us earlier in Luke chapter 8, that Joanna was also a follower of Jesus and actually supported his ministry financially. Now, let's pick it up at, at verse 2 here. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they, that while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Now, now, these are angels. We know they're angels. Luke calls them men so that we can understand that they came in human form. All right? And now only one angel speaks, whom we hear about in all the other Gospels, only mentions the one angel who speaks. Luke alone gives us the fact that there were actually two angels there. And I think the reason is that both Moses and Jesus taught, of course, that two or three witnesses are required to establish something as true. And they're there to bear witness. Now let's pick it up at verse 5. In their fright... The women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. This is like a roller coaster of emotion for these women. I mean, as they're heading to the tomb, of course, they're, they're heavy with grief, and, and, but then they're quickly turned to confusion when they, when they see the empty tomb. And then it turns to fear and excitement when these angels appear and they're reminded of, of Jesus' words that said that I will be crucified, but then raised again. And that didn't, that didn't hit them till that moment. And, and all of a sudden, they had this interjection of hope and it propelled them to the next moment, verse 9. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things. Somebody say, all these things. They told all these things to the eleven and all the other people. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and others with them. So they were saying four or five, maybe, um, who told this to the apostles. And uh, we're going to, at the end, look at how they responded. Um, Here's the thing, they were looking for the right thing, but they were looking in the wrong place. I knew this guy, I'm, let's call him Sam, who never read the Bible, so I encouraged, I encouraged, encouraged him and asked him to start reading the Gospel of John. And a few weeks pass, and I check in with him, and I'm saying, hey Sam, 
how's the Bible reading going? And he says, I stopped. I'm like, Sam, why'd you do that? He says, well, I was really getting, I was really starting to like Jesus, and then he died. So I stopped. And I was like, Sam, you can't stop there. It gets much better. Trust me. There's a killer plot twist at the end you don't see coming. Joking aside, sometimes we can be like Sam. Whether we end up in some kind of cycle of depression or, or shame or guilt or unforgiveness or wh whatever that may be, sometimes we lack motivation to take the steps into God's purposes and plans in our life that he has created us for. This is illustrative of that. And when that happens, we need to turn the page. You see, when we get stuck like that in a cycle, we need to turn the page and embrace the new life that is offered through the resurrection of Jesus. And that brings me to our big idea for today. If you remember anything I said, hopefully you can remember this. It's pretty easy. Remember the cross, but live in the resurrection. Remember the cross, but live in the resurrection. If you're taking notes, that's your first fill in in the worship guide. Always remember the cross. That's where the penalty for our sins were paid. But you know, if Jesus had only just died on the cross and wasn't resurrected, the Bible actually says that we would be still lost in our sin. You know, some people in the church at Corinth, they thought that there was no resurrection. So the Apostle Paul writes a letter in 1 Corinthians 15, and he says this. He says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's in vain, in the King James, it says. You are still in your sins. Paul is saying no resurrection means that sin hasn't been definitively dealt with. Because he goes on to teach there and in a book of Romans that sin and death are inseparably linked. Why? Because you got to go back to the creation moment. First couple pages of the Bible. Sin and death both enter the world through Adam. And Adam and Eve, rather than trusting in God's definition of good, he creates the world seven times, says that it's good. But rather than choosing to, to uh, trust God, they define right and wrong for themselves. And they eat from the, true, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As a result, sin and death entered into the world and they're banished from the Garden of Eden, from God's presence. But, but this is actually a mercy. If you look closely at the text, because what, what God didn't want was them to eat from now the tree of life in their fallen state and live in that fallen state for eternity. Jesus comes as the one that's prophesied in Genesis, crushing the head of the serpent through his righteous life, his sacrificial death, and his resurrection that defeats sin and death. So through Christ, we regain access to the tree of eternal life. Theologian Robert Jensen said it this way, the risen Christ is the tree of life. Sorry. So we must also remember that we should, must always rather remember the cross, but we don't want to live there. Right? We, we, we're, we're to live in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 24 is going to show us how. I'm going to give you some practical steps you can take here. How do we live in the resurrection? Number one, stop looking for Jesus in the tomb. Stop looking for Jesus in the tomb. He's not some dead wise man, okay? He's living. He's alive. So the first thing that you need to recognize is that the tomb is empty. Back to verse three, when they entered the tomb, they said, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Somebody say the body. You see, this is not a spiritual resurrection. This is a physical body. We learn in John's gospel that Mary Magdalene actually held on to Jesus. And Thomas, of course, touched his wounds. And later in this chapter, if you read ahead, we're not going to get there today, in verse 36, Luke tells us when Jesus finally appears to the disciples, at first they think that he's a ghost. And Jesus is like, really? I look like a ghost to you? I'm standing right here, right? In fact, I'm starving. You got anything to eat? All this rising from the dead stuff, it really works up an appetite. But the moment, this moment here, the women are understandably confused, enter the angels, and they're asking 
a question that has echoed for two millennia. Why do you look for the living among the dead? A question that we must ask ourselves today. Why do we do this? Why do we look for the living among the dead? He is not there. He has risen. My uncle Leo was a a, a De La Salle brother who dedicated his life to teaching and helping poor and at-risk youth in the city of in New York City. And he was a big inspiration to me growing up. When I was 18 years old, Uncle Leo took me to a beautiful retreat center located in the Santa Monica Hills in California. It was run by the Franciscans. And as we're walking the grounds, we came upon a garden that was called the Way of the Cross. And he told me how on a previous visit that he had walked this garden in prayer and meditating and reflecting on Jesus on the cross. Nearly two hours pass and suddenly he hears Jesus speak to him. Not audibly, okay, but in his spirit he heard, but I'm not on the cross anymore. I'm not there. I'm alive. Come meet me where I am. Many people think that Jesus is merely a great teacher who, who lived a noble life and maybe died a noble death, but he is much more than that. Jesus is not merely a hero of the past. He is a living reality in the present. He's not on the cross, nor is he in a tomb. So today I invite you to meet with the living God. What happened with my friend Sam, unfortunately, became a metaphor for his life. He neglected to turn the page and experience the hope of the resurrection in his life. And while I still pray for him and have hope that things will change, to this day, he is still struggling. He is still struggling spiritually, emotionally, physically, in every single way. Don't make that same mistake. Whatever you're facing right now, turn the page. Turn the page. He's not in a tomb. He is living and active. He's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. He's in a place of authority. And, and today he can minister to you each and every moment through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So whatever it is for you, a cycle of guilt or shame, or maybe you have difficulty forgiving others, and so you're, you're struggling to receive his forgiveness in your life. For some, it may be you're lacking meaning and, and purpose in your life. Still others, it could be a cycle of despair that paralyzes you from moving forward. Whatever it is, let go of your old ways of thinking and being because Jesus is not some dead sage that just gives you some good advice. He is Lord of all, and he has come to help everyone who calls on him. Remember the cross but live in the resurrection. The first step is stop looking for Jesus in the tomb. The second is this. Seize the message that conquers death. Seize the message that conquers death. To seize means to take hold of. Okay, and while we may not be able to understand the miracle of the resurrection, it, you know, it's kind of outside of our experience, right? When someone dies, generally they what? They stay dead, Right? So this is out of our experience. But here's the thing. While we cannot fully understand the miracle of the resurrection, we can apprehend it. Meaning you can take hold of it in a way that impacts your life every day. Verse 4 says that when they found the tomb empty, they were wondering about this. They wanted to know what's going on. In other words, they were seeking truth about Jesus. And seeking truth is the first step to seizing truth. But many of you are going through life asleep. You're not seeking ultimate truth or reality. And I lovingly invite you to wake up. Wake up. Now when you or I seek, we may not get two angels rolling up on us. In robes like lightning. And you know what? I'm kind of okay with that. All right, because my anxiety would be like over 9,000, right? Whatever they say, right? But, but Jesus said, if you seek, you will find. And that's what happened to Mary, Mary, and Joanna. That kind of sounds like a hip-hop group, Mary, Mary, and Joanna. Well, maybe not Joanna. She's not so hip-hop, but Mary, Mary. 
verse 6. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. You see, when you seek, God will speak. When you seek, God will speak. But if you're asleep, he won't. It might be through prayer. It might be through a sermon. It might be through a, a verse that popped up on your phone. It might be through a conversation with a believer. Even if you have doubts, and guess what we all do, including pastors. Even if you have doubts, keep seeking. Because you know what? Seeking leads to believing. Seeking leads to believing. And that's how you take hold of this message. Back in January, one of my favorite scholars, his name is Dr. Gary Habermas, he released his magnum opus, on the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Volume one is 1,072 pages. Don't worry, we're only gonna cover 872 pages this morning. <laughs> Just kidding. But to help you build your faith, I'm gonna quickly highlight five of the most compelling evidences from his book. And what makes these facts so unique is that virtually every expert from atheists to Christian historians agree on these five things. Number one, crucifixion. Jesus died by crucifixion. Sources inside of the Bible, outside of the Bible, experts, of scholars agree from atheists to Christians that Jesus really existed and he really was executed on a cross under Pontius Pilate. The second one is this, appearances. Virtually all the experts agree that Jesus' early followers had experiences of meeting Jesus, meeting the resurrected Jesus, so much so that, that they will explain it by hallucination, but it doesn't even make sense. Now, that doesn't mean that non-Christian scholars believe that they actually met Jesus, okay? But they do acknowledge that Jesus' disciples believed that they met Jesus. The third fact is this, persecution. As a result, they were transformed to the point of being willing to die for this message. So think about that. People may die for what they believe is true, but not for what they know is false, and so if this is some kind of hoax that the, that the disciples stole the body or all the different things that people say, why would you die for a lie that you knew was a lie? Number four, skeptics. Well, oh, my iPad is kind of flipping out. Skeptics. Paul is one of the skeptics. He was a religious zealot who persecuted Christians. And, and James, who was the brother of Jesus, think about that. He was a skeptic. He did not follow Jesus during his life. You need to know that. He was only convinced after as he faced the resurrected Jesus. I mean, now think about that. What would it take for you to believe that, that your brother is God incarnate? <laughs> it takes something, right? Something's got to account for these conversions. Paul's not going to have a delusion of being, being, uh, seeing Jesus when he was persecuting Jesus. Lastly, early. The gospel messages of the death and resurrection of Jesus began to be taught very soon after this event. Why, why is that important? Because eyewitnesses were alive, which meant that there are people there to contradict them. All they had to do was produce the body. And, and it says that so many eyewitnesses, Paul talks about this very early. Here's the thing. The resurrection is not a fairy tale. It is rooted in history. And now, while you may not be able to fully understand the miracle of the resurrection, you know what? I get that. But here's the thing. You can apprehend it. You can take hold of it, and you can seize the message that conquers death. And guess what? That will change your life. The first step to live in resurrection is to stop looking for Jesus in the tomb. Number two, seize the message that conquers death. And number three, speak the story of transformation. Speak the story of transformation. We call this to testify. How many got a testimony in here? Yeah, we got to share that. We got to share that with a lost and dying world. Verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and all the others. And Matthew adds this, Matthew 28, 8. I, I love this. It says that the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy. Isn't that an interesting combination of emotions here? And they ran 
to tell the disciples. John tells us that Mary Magdalene ran to tell the disciples. There's a mixture of, of joy and excitement and fear, and yet they spoke the story of the resurrection. Now, you may have noticed when you sat down today, our team made this small gift as a reminder of this point. Um, it's the gift of sugar, all right? Okay, Peeps. Peeps are my favorite or Easter candy, second only to Reese's chocolate peanut butter eggs. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. We figured that the kids were getting baskets, so we'd give you a little bit of a sugar high to help you keep up with them. But besides for the sugar energy, they are a reminder, and I love what the team wrote on this. Jesus is risen. Tell your peeps. Jesus is risen, tell your peeps. I wanted to make that my third point, but Tina said no. Just as the women shared their experience of the resurrection, we too are called to speak life to a dead world that is around us, proclaiming the good news of Jesus because it's the only thing that can bring life to this dead world, proclaiming his victory over sin and death before time runs out. But here's the thing. you got to be prepared because not everybody's going to listen. If you've read ahead, you know what happens in verse 11. But let's look at verse 11. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Here's the thing. Despite opinions to the contrary, people in the first century knew just as well as we do that dead people don't come back. Okay? C.S. Lewis called this our chronological snobbery. When we think we, of, an, of a scientific and enlightened age, we're above the ancients, right? Those people didn't know the laws of nature. Listen, the reason why Joseph was worried about Mary's pregnancy wasn't because he didn't know where babies came from, but because he did. It's the same with the resurrection. The disciples were not going around saying, oh, well, isn't that interesting? I guess sometimes people just come back from the dead. In fact, when you read the Gospels, you'll see that each and every one of them were skeptical. How very modern of them. They were just as unprepared for this event as we would have been, and yet they became convinced. Now, in the first century, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, women were not even considered credible witnesses in a court of law. And so this is one of many reasons why historians accept those five facts that I mentioned earlier. I love what historians call it. They call it the criterion of embarrassment. Isn't that nice? The criterion of embarrassment says that when a text includes embarrassing details to, a community, to the community that produces the text they're much more likely to be real and authentic and telling the truth. Think about that. The Bible is kind of like full of these embarrassing criteria. I mean, think about Noah after he comes out of the ark. What does he do? He gets drunk, he gets naked, and he gets weird. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and in, in Moses' anger, what does he do? He, he offs an Egyptian and his brother Aaron makes a golden calf for them to worship as Moses is up on the mountain meeting with God. David, the promised leader of the Israelites, he commits adultery. And then when he thinks he's going to get caught, he has the husband whacked. That's not too far from our politicians today. Oops, did I say that out loud? <laughs> Peter denies Christ. Paul proudly persecutes Christians and the disciples, their, their pettiness and, and their fear and their doubts. It permeates the whole gospel. So here's the thing. If you're going to make up a story, why would you open yourself up to criticism and skepticism by making the women in all four gospels the primary and first eyewitnesses to the resurrection and the apostles not believing them? The fact is you wouldn't make up a story like that. The fact is because it's true. What I love about Mary, Mary, and Joanna is they spoke bravely despite the fact that they knew they'd be ridiculed. Verse 9 again says, they told all these things to the 11 and all the others. They didn't even leave out the part about the, the angels in the shiny suits. They said it all. 
Can you imagine how that felt? Try to put yourself in their shoes. Well, you kind of are in their shoes, right? Because if you start talking about Jesus to people, they start going, ooh, okay, yeah. all right, yeah, that person's special. But hear me, they were faithful despite their fears. They were faithful despite their feelings. And they spoke the story of transformation, and we need to do the same. And that brings me to our call to action for today. Step into resurrection power by living in his presence. Step in to resurrection power. Where do you get that? By living in his presence. That means I am no longer going to try to live on my own, in my own strength. I'm no longer going to be looking for Jesus on a cross or in a tomb. I'm going to live in his presence now. The Apostle Paul plants a church in Ephesus, and he spends three years helping them grow. And later, he hears that they're struggling, and he writes a letter to encourage them, and he opens with a beautiful prayer. Don't have time to do the whole prayer. But in this prayer, he, he prays for the Ephesians to receive wisdom and to experience the fullness of God's power in their life. Just two verses here. Verse 19 I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. There's actually four words describing God's power in the original Greek here. We're just going to look at two. The first one is dunamis. And dunamis is a mighty power to accomplish something. This is the kind of power that he gives. It's where we get the English word dynamo. Do you know what a dynamo is? Maybe you don't. But it's, it's an electric dynamo is what's inside a Tesla. Okay? And that's the Tesla S plaid. That's what empowers it, capable of going zero to 60 in under two seconds. That's the kind of power that God offers. The second word for God's power here is energia, which is where we get the word energy. And how many of you could use a little of that right now in your life? Come on now. Simply the resurrection power is the power to live the life that God has called you to. But the problem is that many of us try to serve God without God. Without God's power. And so you know what? That's a recipe for burnout. And did you catch who receives the power in verse 19? God's power for us who believe. Meaning the church. In fact, when Paul says you, all through Ephesians, it's all about the church. Even when he says, if he says we, you, or us, it's all plural. He's saying, y'all, y'all, right? All y'all. The fulfillment of this promise happens in the church. Back to verse 18, Paul says that the riches of his glorious inheritance, he's describing this experience, which is found where? Let's say it together. We find the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Do you see that? His riches won't be found in the world, but in his people, the church. And as fallible and flawed as the church can be, particularly if I'm a member, (laughs) the reality is, is we experience his resurrection power together. That's how we do it. When we worship together, when we fellowship together, when we serve together as his hands and his feet to a broken world, that's where we experience God's presence and his power in our life. Real talk here as I just land the plane. I want you to say it's so amazing to see so many of you here to celebrate Easter. I'm humbled that you're here. And I want want to invite you to come back. Come back next Sunday. Because it's when you stay connected to his body consistently, that's when you will stay connected to the source of power. The same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in a place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. You see, when you're connected to Christ, you you are living a life on a higher plane. With Christ, you're living a life far above anything and everything you will ever face. 
everything from political uncertainty of our times, your own personal struggles when you are connected to him and his body, the church, you will find support, you will find encouragement, you will find a sense of belonging and purpose that will help you navigate this life. That's resurrection power. Not just the power to survive, but the power to thrive no matter what this life throws at you. Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Gracious Father, I praise you and I thank you. I thank you for your presence where my words have failed. God, I pray you would speak. I pray for those today who maybe are in a cycle of guilt or shame. Or maybe you're struggling with fear. It could be someone here struggling with a lack of purpose. I pray that, that you'd help them today to, to turn the page. May we all stop hanging out in a tomb. And may we start seeking you, the living God. Help us to take hold of the message that conquers death as we experience your transformation in our lives. I pray that you give us, that gives us the boldness to speak the story of transformation to others. Father, I pray for anyone right now who has a dead area in their life. It could be a spiritual dryness. It could be a physical situation. Someone here, someone here is struggling with negative emotions, and I, I pray that you move in a mighty and powerful way. Lord, resurrect the dead areas of people's lives right now, oh God. Lord, if someone in a difficult relationship, I pray you move. Still others of you might be facing financial dead end, whatever it is. Father, I pray that you resurrect the dead areas of our life by the same mighty power that you raised Christ from the dead your name. And as we stay in this moment of prayer, I just want to speak to those who maybe today you feel far from God. You could be in this sanctuary. Maybe you joined us online. The Bible says that we all have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. That's, that's you, that's me, that's everyone. And it's our sin that separates us from God, just like Adam and Eve were pulled out of the garden. But that's why Jesus came. He came and he lived the perfect life that you and I could not to become the perfect sacrifice on the cross for your sins and mine. But here's the thing, the tomb is empty. He's alive and he invites you to come to him today. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. That's not a maybe. That's a promise. And when you call on him and confess your sins, he will forgive every sin you have ever done and he will make you new. If that's your prayer today, I want you to join me in praying. You're not joining a church. You're not even saying you understand all this, but you're saying, you know what? I'm ready to say yes to Jesus. If that's you, just pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I ask that you forgive me for my sins. I, I turn from them and I, I turn to your son, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for being my Savior. Today, I give you leadership in my life as my Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you come now and fill me and empower me to live the life that you have called me to live. Thank you, O oh God, for new life. I give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Lifeway, let's celebrate what God is doing here in people's life. Let's celebrate. He has risen. And as we head out this week, our worship team is going to lead us in one more song. But let me just say, if you prayed that prayer, giving your life to Jesus, we want to give you a free booklet. It's called the New Believer's Handbook. It's a quick and easy read to help you take your next steps with Jesus. If you're joining us in person, you can grab one of these at our guest services uh, on your way out, or you can ask our prayer team at the end of the service. Um, if you are joining online, you just simply text the word book to 860 860- 560-1950 and we will mail a copy out to you at no charge. Again, text book to 860-560-1950. As our worship team leads, I'm going to invite you where you are one last time if you're able to 